welcome back to episode number four of Short and Sweet, the food and drink podcast about all things local. I'm joined by Heather Atwood. How are you, Heather? I'm good. Good to see you again. Good to see you. These episodes are just peeling off now. Yeah. We're them off. This yeah. is great. We're at four. Yeah. Four? Yeah. four now. And this should be a fun one today, too. I can't wait to uh, get into the subject and then uh, test the actual subject, too. Yeah. We have a test case right oh, down there. so good. I can't wait. So, uh, yeah, if this is your first time checking us out, yeah, we talk all food, all drink, all cape, and all the time. And uh, we have very special guest today that we want to get right to because uh, she has amazing stories to share with us. So uh, should I just welcome her yeah, right now? Yeah, We want to welcome Melissa Smith-Abbott. How are you, Melissa? Thank you. Thanks Thank you for, for having us. me. I have a lot of gratitude for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And we have to point out that Melissa came from teaching her yoga class to be with us. So, and she rushed here from yoga class. So she has the yoga glow. Happening. <laughs> Anything for <laughs> art, Melissa. I like right. that. Right. A sacrifice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so Heather, you actually had contacted me first to drop Melissa's name as being a potential guest. Like, yep, yeah, absolutely. And so, what was it about uh, Melissa that you like? We have to have her on ASAP. So Melissa is like the um, the rock of history on Cape Ann, and specifically Rockport. Her family dates back three generations to the days in Rockport when it was just a, uh, it was like a gala happening every night in the summertime. And Melissa's family was responsible for that. Right, Mm. Melissa? Well, they had a restaurant in Rockport. And which restaurant? The Blacksmith Shop Restaurant, which was um, my great-grandmother, Melissa Collins, opened um, in the late 1920s. And that was during the Depression. And she had read an advertisement in the New York Times saying an old smithy blacksmith shop was for sale in Rockport. So she came here in a Model T with my grandmother, who was, you know, maybe a teenager at the time. And they found this blacksmith shop and they got it for next to nothing because the blacksmith had committed suicide because everyone got cars. And he had been a very popular, loved man in town. But when they bought the place, they didn't really realize what had happened. And that he That had... story alone. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so when they opened up the restaurant, and so it was kind of, you know, it was the depression. And so they had the forge, so they'd grill things on the forge. And then my grandfather, my great-grandfather, Alan um, Collins, made like wagon wheel chandeliers and wagon wheel tables and that kind of thing. So, Melissa, for those who don't know, where what was a specific location? It was on High Street in Rockport. Okay. It's now a private home. But at that time in the, in the 1920s, that's where the blacksmith shop was. Oh, so this is not the same restaurant in no, Rockport what, now. Uh, it only moved down a few years later. In the 1930s, they built that restaurant. So where, it was still know. your grandmother. It was still my great great grandmother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Melissa, I, okay. Melissa Collins. Okay. And she actually passed away in 1936. But before she passed away, she built that restaurant. Um, that's on the harbor that we know is the blacksmith shop now. And what did she know about running a restaurant in the, that gave her the courage to do this? That's kind of interesting because she had been, um, they had come from Ireland. They had come from Northern Ireland, Belfast. And in that day and age, they'd come over and they'd lived in Natick and Needham. They originally went to New Jersey and they had a restaurant there. And um, there was a lot of uh, discrimination against Irish people then. And of course, from since they were from Northern Ireland, they didn't feel like they were, they were Protestants from Northern Ireland. So they just pretended they were from Wales. <laughs> <laughs> and that passed in Rockport. <laughs> well, the big story was that they were from Cardiff, Wales, which they may have lived in at one time for a short period of time, but they were boiler makers. They had worked on, say, the Titanic and, you know, ships like that that were built in Belfast. And they, they could cook. They could cook, and they came here, and she could cook. And she had her own restaurants, and she'd worked at some uh, schools in uh, Rhode Island. They'd lived in New York City and, and also in Connecticut. And they finally, in the 1910, I, have, I, found, um, I found a draft card for my great-grandfather for World War I. And he lived at, get this, 10 Abbott Road in Natick. Huh. 
And the other day I went to a yoga studio out there and I was driving past past and I saw Abbott Road and I went down and I looked at the house they had lived in then. Cool. So that, but they came to Rockport in the depression and they got this place for nothing. They had had a restaurant at one time in uh, Natick, but they were put out of business by Ken's Steakhouse because Ken had liquor. And they had that salad dressing. And they had, <laughs> and they had salad dressing. I get a weird aside to that. I know the guy who designed the Ken Steakhouse logo. Wow. It's James E. from Cape Ann G. Clay. No way. Honest to God. He's, he's, that's what was he, he like 10 when ago. he designed that? But he did it ages ago. Well, the thing is, is that Ken's Steakhouse salad dressing has been around since the 1920s. Huh, so he must have done some updated modern Yeah, probably variation. a more updated. Well, I think probably like in the 70s because my mother, I mean, that we lived by Ken's Steakhouse salad dressing. Yeah, that was the right. Only, but now we're going to move to the Melissa's salad dressing. <laughs> right, so <laughs> that was a big deal for them. When they came to Rockport, they always had this bottle of salad dressing, and it said Melissa's um, garlic original garlic dressing, it makes a salad sing. And that was on every single table. And they sold a ton of it. They made gallons and gallons of it out in the kitchen. And then there had been, at the early 1900s, a bakery on King Street in Rockport that made the Anadama bread. And the people that ran that bakery were named Knowlton. And they delivered the bread on a horse-drawn cart around town wearing blue smocks. So Anadama bread. Pre- I'm going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get to yeah, that. All right. I'm going to let you talk. Because just I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Okay. So, so when they first came, the Knowltons were, were, were already uh, baking, the baking Anadama it, bread. but then they went out of business. So my grandmother started baking it in the upstairs of the blacksmith shop in the late 1930s. And did she adopt their recipe? Did she find a recipe of her own? She adopted it. It was a local recipe that people talked about. And then back then, they said at that time that it was a 150-year-old recipe. Oh, wow. And unique to the area. Yes, because it was a Rockport fisherman hmm. who um, had a lazy wife. That's the story. We could have, we could, nowadays that might not be politically yeah, correct. Yeah, we might so. me too this story. We might, we, we might hashtag me too this, yeah, but right. yes. Becky, cut my mic off. The, <laughs> the story back then is that she was lazy and she wouldn't make him anything for dinner and he came home from fishing. Now, back in those days, you had to remember there wasn't a lot of food. There wasn't a grocery store. They had cornmeal from Ipswich. They had molasses. We're that, talking about early 19th century. Maybe We're even probably earlier. talking like Revolutionary yeah, War times. Right, yeah, okay. Or right, so early 18th. 18 1800s, maybe early 1800s, they had hogsheads of of molasses that came up in the triangle trade, and um, they would fill the hogshead with molasses. The the hogshead is the name for the barrel. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Did you know that? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And so what? I, I, knew, I knew it wasn't a hogshead. Okay. <laughs> so this is what happened was that the molasses was very thick. And so they would take the stuff off the top and sell it. That would be like the primo molasses. And the stuff on the bottom was real thick and and just like... Tarry. Tarry, exactly. Right, That's like the tar. word for it. And um, so they people that were poor, like fishermen or whatever, they would have the bottom of the hogshead. They would get that for cheaper. So they had that. They had the cornmeal. And he mixed the corn, and they'd make cornmeal mush, which would sit on the back of the wood stove. Cornmeal mush and molasses was like a big meal back then. That's what people ate. So he mixed it up with flour and yeast, and the whole time that he did that, he was screaming, Anna, her name was Anna, Anna, damn her, Anna, damn her. And the neighbors heard him screaming, and they just, you know, they ch- they called the bread Anna Dama Anna bread. Dama bread. Anna Dama bread because Anna Dam her. And they st- the, apparently the bread tasted good. It's really delicious. Yeah. And yeah. Well, I know it's delicious now, but even then, and the neighbors oh, yeah. started to make the bread. The Is neighbors that- made the bread, and that's the, the the local lore, which I've tried to figure out. Now, there's other local lore that my grandmother had this stack these little dolls of Anna and Joe Niami, which is a Finnish name. So maybe the Rockport fish, fin, fisherman was a Finn from the Finnish community, mm. which makes sense because they make that wonderful nisu and all that type of thing. So I had actually one time tried to have a genealogist try to find Anna and Joe in the area, and I had, didn't have any luck. 
And, and because I was it. trying to determine actually how old this recipe was because, you know, they they could say in the 1940s and 50s it's 150 years old when it really was only 100 years old. Right. We don't really know. Right. right. We don't really know where it came from, whether it came from the Finnish community, like the stonecutters, or if it came from... Um, you know, the actual Rockport fishermen story. Right, right. right. Now, are there any other cultures that uh, claim it as their own? No. So it, it probably really did come from Rockport. Oh, it probably really did. Yeah. And so the real authentic way that they made it was with the bottom of the hogshead barrel. Hmm. So and to reproduce that, you have to, to use... get the really thick blackstrap molasses, which is the mistake that people make when they go to make it here. You have to go to the health food store and just ask for the darkest molasses you can get. And it's harder to find now. Can you smell my molasses? I made this loaf of bread I, I, out of Melissa's cookbook. <laughs> and, uh, we'll I see. Found that Once we yeah, cut we'll it, see. I okay. can tell you. Yeah. Um, so but for real? For real, yeah. because I make it that old-fashioned way. Now, so when my grandfather, the the all right, so the bakery started upstairs from the blacksmith shop, and it was called Blacksmith Shop Pastries, and they made a lot of things, and they sold it in the restaurant. Then they moved to Main Street, where the Feather and Wedge is now, and they had a little bakery there, say, in the 1940s, like sort of after World War II. Well, during World War II, things slowed down, and there wasn't much happening. And um, then after things, things picked up. So in the early 1950s, by 1956, they built a huge bakery up um, by the railroad station in Rockport behind. It's a big white building behind at the um, end. It's still there, right? It's still there. I just and my figured out. My there. grandfather built that in 1956, and it cost $250,000 to build at that time. Wow. He employed 70 people, and he had 40 trucks. And they distributed the Anadama bread throughout New England from Rockport. That is just crazy to me, That's that right. Rockport had this booming industry. Right. and But the bread business is a very difficult business. So at the time, Pepperidge Farm was really small, just like they are, and they had the same kind of things. Um, but when my grandfather built that bakery, he made sure that he would buy this, you know, terrible, thick molasses. And my childhood memories is of this, ch this thick molasses being cooked with the cornmeal, and you let it sit overnight. Like, you can kind of throw it together, but it's not the same if it sits. That's what makes it chewy and really super delicious. So you steam the cornmeal. I'm just going to jump to the recipe double, really quickly. Double pan boiler. Right. Uh, right. Right. And then you add the molasses Two and the butter to Two cups of water, it. half a cup of the cornmeal, and then it's like, um, I think it's like a half a cup or of the of blackstrap molasses. Right, right. And, and a little you, salt and the butter, two tablespoons of butter. And the butter, right. And that mush sits overnight. Night. Okay, I did it right. Right. <laughs> right. So you can, like, let it just sit for an hour and still do it. It's just not the same. Right. Right. So that's what makes it chewy. And so my grandfather was actually offered um, some kind of a deal with some molasses company if he used this lighter molasses and he wouldn't do it. God bless him. I know. I he love that. He Go wouldn't do it. <laughs> and he he was he was a very handsome man. His name was William Percy Collins Smith. And he had come from Canada and married my grandmother. He was a waiter in the blacksmith shop restaurant. And he married my grandmother and they had a beautiful marriage. And but he had these Model T replica cars that had like the Anadama logo on it. Real so, cars. Replica, yeah. but mo replica Model Ts, but life size, car yeah, size. Yeah, that he drove around, and it was like a marketing thing at the time. So when they opened the first National on Eastern Avenue, which is now Shaw's, he drove the mayor of Gloucester at the time in there, and they opened it up. I mean, that's the kind of thing. In every parade, every Horribles parade, every Rockport p parade, he'd be in there, and we'd always have a float where we'd have the wood stove on it and be baking the bread in the wood stove on the float. They actually used to do it and, you know, dressed up in old-fashioned clothes. So that was kind of this thing with my grandmother. She started Motive Number no. 1 Day in the 1940s, 1946. She was the chairman of the um, Rockport Board of Trade, which eventually became the Chamber of Commerce. And she wanted to get people to Rockport before the season started so they would have this... Um, 
Rockport Day kind of thing, and everybody in town would dress up in old-fashioned clothes so that people would, it was like this charming thing. People would come to Rockport where it was charming and old-fashioned. And now, that, do you remember that? Did oh, you yeah. Do that? Oh, yeah. I have pictures of myself in the old-fashioned baby carriage pushing my sister in old-fashioned clothes and my mother in, like, the long dresses and the hats and all that kind of thing. And that was a thing. Bring that it was, back, Rockport. Yeah, Bring right. that back. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, you know, I've tried to talk to people about it, but they don't hear because it's just, it's an archaic thing. It's the, the old-fashioned. And some people didn't even believe me. <laughs> That that happened. That that happened, yeah. yes. Yeah. But that, you know, it's way back in the 50s. Well, they probably thought there ago. were pictures from the 1890s. Because we were dressed in those clothes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So that's how they, people would come to Rockport on the train. And then they'd stay. There was no Route 128 then. And they'd stay and they'd rent a house and they'd stay for three weeks. So they'd stay for a month. Or and they would eat at the blacksmith shop. And they'd shop. eat at the blacksmith shop every night. And the artists in Rockport would eat at the blacksmith shop every night because, you know, she would trade for paintings. My grandparents had a beautiful art collection, and they were friends with all the artists. And um, it was a small town, and um, that's kind of how I grew up, or you know, knowing all the artists and, um, you know, Otis Cook and... Yeah, there's Hibbard some pretty famous and, people yeah. who are getting what it's uh, like socialites of famous figures from Boston. Well, New York, yes, like Betty Davis. Oh, whoa. Well, she's from Massachusetts, mm. and she was really good friends with Stanley Wood Woodard, who was a painter, and his father had been a painter in Rockport, and she used to come and visit him. And then there was Sterling Hayden, who grew up in Gloucester, and he was a, a Hollywood actor, but he had also been the top main masked man on the Gertrude Thebo during the schooner races in the 1930s. Uh -huh. And he had become, um, he was very handsome and very tall. And he, he got hired as a Hollywood actor because of that, because those schooner races back then were like, they were like the rock stars of their day kind right. of thing. And so there were people like that. Jackie Gleason, Red Skelton. Came to Rockport? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. And That's they amazing. ate in the blacksmith shop, sure. Wow. Sure. So, and I grew up in the blacksmith shop. I took my first order when I was five years old, <laughs> and uh, and I I that's where I learned to talk. That's where I learned to, um, you know, make nice and sell things. Yeah. What a culture. Yeah. I want to um, ask, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, Melissa. But what was it like for Rockport to have a business that was employing seventy people? You said that was. That was the um, bakery alone. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm departing. Almost the everybody shop. worked for my grandparents. So when I was growing up, I had the same name as my grandmother, and there were two sides of the coin. They either loved her or they hated her. And she was a matriarch. Yeah. She ran the business, and that was at a time when women didn't run businesses. Mm -hmm. But she got away with it. She, she just, she was very strong. She was very kind. She was very loving. She was very giving. Um, and she was gentle in some ways, and in other ways, she did not, um, she didn't take any BS. So she'd tell it like it was, and she would work with other businessmen and whatever. And so she, she so people loved her or hated her. So everyone had to work with her. And I never knew if I said my name was Melissa Smith whether I was going to get the cold shoulder or people we were going to go, oh, yeah, we love right, you, yeah, you know. Right, right. So, uh, yeah. But it must have been such a different community to have yes, such employment, like, right there in your town. Yeah. There wasn't anything else. I mean, there was fishing in Gloucester. Right. And you could cut fish or you could lobster or sell fish or that well, kind of thing. You know, I actually have a connection to this because I grew up in Baltimore um, until I was older. And we went on vacation to Cape Cod, the other right. Cape, um, when I was, like, eight years old. And... I was with my mother and my brothers, and you know, when you're on vacation, you always want to try new things. And we went to the grocery store, and there was this thing called Anadama bread. And I will never get over, like, us all saying, oh, my gosh, this stuff is incredible. And reading the story on the package. The story was on the side of every package. So when I ever figured out, because I've never forgotten that experience, like, that Anadama bread was really good. When I figured out it was your Anadama bread, right. I feel like my life has just come full amazing, circle. Amazing, huh? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right, and that had the story of Anna and Joe and the lazy wife and the cornmeal mush on the side, and then it had my grandparents' signatures, W.P.C. Smith and Melissa Smith, on the side, and then it had a picture of Joe with a bowl, 
<laughs> mixing it up, probably saying Anna, damn her. Yeah, kind right, of thing. Yeah. right. And I even remember it just as a kid growing up in an Italian family, it was like a special treat if you were going to a restaurant or breakfast place that had Anna Dama bread. Right. Like, oh, can we go to that place because they have the it. firehouse? Cause, yeah, because yeah. most kids are just yeah. Could be, you're growing up on white bread or Italian bread or French bread or something. So, but not a lot of rye or pumpernickels or things like right. that around. So, well, my grandfather died in 1970, mm. and then my grandmother um, eventually, a couple years later, sold the bakery. It kind of went out of business. The bakery is a bakery business. It's a really hard business. What's hard about it? Uh, because it's fresh and it goes bad really quick. Mm. And to, to deliver it to great distances, there's mm. not a lot of profit in it. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to bake all night, mm. and then it's available the next morning, and the next day it's no good mm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So when he died, there wasn't really anyone watching it, and that's when she owned the Easterly Inn. She had bought a house on the back shore in the early 1960s, and then she'd gotten a liquor license from when they tore down, I think it was the Gloucester Hotel, which was down in downtown Gloucester, and she got their liquor license, and then she opened up a restaurant with the liquor, and that was the Easter. First, it was the blacksmith shop inn, and then in, like, say, 1962 or three, oh. we changed it to the Easterly Inn, and that's where the Elks is now. Yeah. And so she, she built that business up and ran it, and she was running that at the time. How old was she then? I think she was probably younger than I am now. I mean, she was oh, okay. probably in her 50s. Okay. Yeah. She's a mover and shaker. Oh, yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah. she lived to be like 96 years old. And she ran a guest house in her later years, the Cable House, which was the first transatlantic cable house building. Um, that's in Rockport. That too. was in Rockport. She ran a guest house there from 1946 until she died in the 1990s. Um, she made, we had to put her in the nursing home because she got dementia and she couldn't remember everything. Mm. And she was booking too many people into the same room and then, <laughs> you know, she, she was just, she kind of lost it. But before we put her in the nursing home, I used to live near her and I would help take care of her. I banked like, I don't know, $1,600 for her that week or something. She made money right till the end. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, she was, and she loved people. She was so charming. Uh, so no charming. pressure, Heather, but you tried. Okay. You made Anna Dama bread on your own. Let's just point out. the family recipe here. The family recipe is in this book, The Three Melissas, The Legacy of the Three Melissas. There are also um, recipes from the Blacksmith recipes. Shop and the Easterly Inn, all these uh, Smith recipes. The and Faraday also Inn, they had at one time owned a place called the Faraday Inn. Mm. Right. And, um, so, and there's you know pictures of the old labels of the Blacksmith Shop. And all, I mean the uh, Anna Dammer bread. Yeah. So here, here's the factory and the and the labels, the loaves right. of bread, and there's the Model T that right, exactly. uh, your your grandfather really cool. drove around, right? Yeah. yeah. And here is the recipe, and I did make this recipe. I've, I had made it before, but not for a long time. This picture is when the day they opened the bakery. Oh my I was gosh. three years old then, the huh. day they opened that bakery. Look and at that, those distinguished uh, men. And they were all the selectmen in town. Yeah. Of course. And they a lot of them had been in World War II. Aww. Yeah. Ernie Poole, who was a postman, had been in World War II. Wow. And that's him standing next to my grandfather. I don't know who everyone is. Else that is that your grandfather in. in the center? My grandfather is yes, this is him, the bald handsome man right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just in uh, case you want to see bald handsome. Oh. Mr. <laughs> Smith. <laughs> William. The other one. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I did make this loaf of bread. All right. I was a little fearful that I used the wrong size pan. That's okay. Let's it, just cut into. Well, it. you know, thing serving sizes back in the day when say this recipe was happening were a lot smaller, and so we have bigger yes, serving that's sizes. Can I ask a random question? Sure. How is is this, how different is this from Portuguese sweet bread? Because I think Portuguese sweet bread uses cornmeal, but it's brown sugar instead of molasses. Is I that... think so, but I don't really They're know. No eggs. Mm. And they use no eggs. eggs yeah, no and eggs. Portuguese sweet bread is full of, of eggs. Right. Okay. Right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. And it, white bread. It white tastes bread. a little different. Now, are you doing things like um, anadama breadcrumbs or croutons or things like that? Or... Right. So in the restaurant, they would reuse it. They made this. So remember that years ago, you'd get like a basket of crackers and the dip like yeah. a cottage cheese dip or something at a restaurant. Well, they would make their own Melba toast crackers in the basket uh. with like the either the 
uh, a cheese dip or the cottage cheese dip that they put on the table. Yeah. Just sort of a year-round thing. It wasn't like a seasonal bread. It wasn't like a dessert bread. It's just sort of an all-purpose. It was a year-round bread. I grew up on it. I ate it every day growing up. And you're not tired of it? Um, well, I don't eat a lot of bread now because I'm more on the low carb. <laughs> I'm mostly bread, mostly carb. But uh, no, no, and I bake it on the holidays for my family. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I never went into the bread business or the restaurant business, although I've worked in restaurants and helped people with them because I actually worked my whole first half of my life in the restaurant, and um, yeah. I had enough of that. So you know where I remember having this when I was a kid? It was at the Union Hill Coffee Shop. Right, which right. Which is where Thai Choice is right. now. For sure. But I was just even thinking of other places. But still Lila of... F. Clinterberg made the bread oh. over in Lanesville. And she sold to the firehouse. Oh, okay. And, and to the, um, you know, that place on Union You're right. Hill. Yeah. And Look it's a it's a local recipe that you really, you know, people have made. And people have tried to go into business with it, but it's just never really taken off. And Mac Bell had it in um, the glass sailboat for oh, no a while. Kidding. Yeah. I mean, d there was a... It was so funny. There was this girl that I grew up with who um, was baking it over in Essex for a few years, like back in the 1980s. You know, people try to make a go of it, but it's hard to make business. It's hard to make a living. It's expensive ingredients. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, cor the molasses, maybe. Cornmeal. It's not, it's not that right, expensive. Right, but by the time, you know, you put it all together and you sell it for... Seven dollars a loaf. Well, now they sell it for seven dollars a loaf. Right. But yeah. they have to pay the, you know. Right. Right. The cost of wherever they're setting up to sell it. Right. And that that that's basically half your money. Well, and it's then, still popular. It's so still you in make, a ton of restaurants. So maybe locally. you make a dollar on a loaf. Right. You got to sell a lot of loaves. Why doesn't Pepperidge Farm have an endemic? Because my grandmother took them to court. Oh, that's they, why. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to Don't start. Don't mess with an, Melissa. <laughs> they tried to start an Anadama bread, and she took them to court because they had a trademark on it, and um, they and they and she won, and they had a cornmeal and molasses bread for many years, but they didn't do it right. It was real light. It wasn't the dark. We tried it. I remember us going right. back and to it wasn't Baltimore. The same. It was not the same. It at was all. not yeah. the same. And then they they stopped making it um, after a while. Yeah. Um, is this but mine? yeah, but they've never stopped local people from doing it. Yeah, because it's a local thing. Right, right. And then nobody really wanted to be in the bread business. None of my my father, my uncle, no nobody wanted to be in the restaurant or bread business because we'd all grown up in it, and yeah. we wanted to do yeah. other things. So, Melissa, you're doing this now, or is sure, it? Just, sure, I don't course. know if it was too close. Yeah, you to have to have it. Your yoga come down. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm starving after 90 minutes of hot yoga. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I really want some young person with lots of energy to say, I'm going to start an Anadema bakery in Rockport, Massachusetts and, and yeah, well, I mean, lease 40 trucks. God love them if they do. Right? You know, it's not an easy business no. like anything. And, and so that's why, okay. what do you, you think? know. I love Anadema bread. There's a, t <laughs> there's a time for everything. Mm. And so you just never know. It probably will get reinvented in some other way mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. at some other time. It's so, good, Heather. Oh, let me is take it a good? Bite. Yeah, I'll do Anadama French Toast. Mm. Mm. This is Anadama is it good? Uh, Benedict. Did I get it right? Mm. All really? Right. Thumbs up from the family? Mm. Could be a little darker molasses, but pretty good. Mm. No way. Now, this is plantation molasses. Mm. It was, it was the darkest I could get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you can taste it. You taste it in the crust. You get well, like, a little bit of sourness. Sten and Clintonburg goes to someplace in Boston mm. and buys buckets of it, and it's just a little teeny darker. Okay. And that's okay. And his is maybe, but it's still mm. not like the old fashioned. But you got the chewiness, and you can the chewiness is the what chewiness I was, yeah. is where it's at. That's, so I'm very you impressed can forgive, by that. Actually, you can't get the really dark right bottom right. of the hogshead molasses in huh. right. Huh. But you got the chewiness, and it's very good. It's very delicious. It does not matter what it looks like. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Once you it's slice very into beautiful. It, right. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. That's good. Mm. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think so. Mm -hmm. So you make French toast with your anadama bread. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. French toast. I've had um, Benedict, anadama Benedict oh, before. Oh yeah, that's so good. Mm. Yeah, you can't go wrong. No, mm -hmm. it's it's fantastic for breakfast. Oh, and I love I love the chew. I like yeah. to chew my bread. Right, exactly. See, I like that little bit of sweetness. And then if 
I think this butter is salted, actually. Yeah. Is it? So uh, there's Slightly, just a yep. little bit of salt. That, I, that Sweet combination salt. is really good. For sure. So if you put an egg on top of that with some salt and pepper, that's what's really great. Right. Poached egg. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm ready for all more. Right, I know. So. so that's what happened is people kept asking me for all the recipes and a lot of the recipes from the Easterly Inn. And that's why I wrote the book, because I was sick of writing it out on little pieces of paper. So in 2010... And the I, salad dressing is in here. The salad dressing. My grandmother did not give me the recipe till I was 35 years old. It was a secret. She never told anybody how to do it. And then I never really gave out the secret. But I figured nowadays, what difference does it make? It has raw eggs in it. So you really can't make it commercially anyway. But I still make it at home with, like, pasteurized eggs. You can find that. Yeah, I use Or if eggs. you don't care. Right. You know, they, you know they're fresh. Right. Then right. fine. Yeah. And this is them. still available, right, Melissa, if people want to grab a copy? Yes, you, you can get it at Amazon.com. It's The Legacy of Three Melissas by Melissa Smith Abbott. And it's also available on the Kindle as well as on the um, hard copy. Cool. And we'll share this, too. We will. And a little caption will share that recipe for you. So right. thanks right. so Good much enough. for spending this time with us. All right. That was a great story. All the stories were great. Uh, yeah. Honestly, you, we have to have you back. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. We're not done with the stories here. For real. I've yeah. got more, believe me. Yeah. I, we yeah. believe I've it. I've got yeah. a lot. <laughs> so cool. Okay, thanks again. And hold on, because we'll get to our side dish in just a bit. All right. But, uh, yeah, we're talking to Melissa Smith-Abbott, and we're talking Anna Damabrit. All right, we're back for the short and sweet side dish now, or we've been talking with Melissa Smith Abbott for a while about Anadama bread and 900 backstories that led to where we are now. Uh, I want to throw something out here. I'm a bread freak. I love it. I will literally, I can do, I can sit down and have a loaf. I am and, too. I am. Yeah, I, bread I'm pretty is, shameless about it. Yeah, me too. So to me, it's it's always, it's the heel. What do you, first of all, what do you call the end of the bread? We had this discussion with our interns before and none of them call it the heel. I call They've it never the heard of a heel of ah, bread, right? What do we call the, let's just call the, the end piece. Yeah, That's, or I mean, the end. Where's the romance in that? <laughs> no, I like the heel, or I don't know what you would call the middle part of the bread either, but what do you call it, Melissa? Well, the end cut, no. <laughs> 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 like on a roast, roast beef. Yeah. No, we called it the heel. Yeah. And the heel sometimes, you know, didn't get used. And so that would turn into croutons. Oh, really? For the salads but at to the me, blacksmith like, shop. Th that's the best part of the bread. And especially it something as chewy is. as an anadama. I know. I think so, too. And it makes the best toast, too, that heel. Yeah. With a little butter on it. Yeah. Right. That's the good part. I disagree. I am the cent. Give me the center. Go right in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want this the soft. The I want it to be very soft. And I want um, a more equal, no, a higher ratio of soft to crust. And it, when you take the heel, it's all crust. And yeah, you got the, the consistency. See those little bubbles in there? That's yeah. like perfect. That's how Anna It was Diana really good, is. Heather. I'm so proud. That's how, no, really certainly proud. you did it right. Yeah. Well, oh, I really am. So here's my other question. Is there like an Anadema bread pudding? Yes. My grandmother made that all the time, and we served it in the blacksmith oh, shop let's and talk the about Easterly that. Inn. Right? Yep. Yeah, Anadema bread pudding. Really? Yeah. yeah we need to my, bring that back. Yeah, it's I'm, delicious. I'm ready. Yeah. Right, so this like, is a shout out to anyone out there, anyone who runs a restaurant, a bakery. Let's do this. Yeah, really. And then and contact us when you've done it. When you put your anadema For bread real. on the menu and the anadema bread pudding well, on yeah. the menu. Back right? in the day, they had the grape nut custard pudding, mm. the Indian pudding. So now, what was that? What? Indian pudding is basically like an anadema bread. It's a custard made. You don't know what Indian pudding is? No. It's a custard made with with eggs, eggs and cream, and molasses. And the cornmeal. And, corn and you cook it all up, and then you'd put some nutmeg on top. Huh. And they used to bake it in big sheet pans, and then you'd put it in like a ramekin and serve it with ice cream or um, whipped cream. Oh. And that was a standard in all restaurants around here until recently. People don't make the Indian pudding anymore. Wow. Yeah. I have to um, put a little tiny plug in for my cookbook. Yeah, sure. I interviewed a Wampanoag Indian chief who oh. actually – owned his own restaurant too and he gave me his Indian pudding. Oh restaurant. really? Excellent. And it is it is pretty killer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah it's, don't bring it's it really in, delicious. <laughs> that stuff is good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is really but it's really unique because uh you know it's a pudding like texture for sure. 
but it has this molasses and cornmeal flavor. Mm. And uh, and it cooks a long time, so it gets almost caramelized. Right. Yeah, exactly. in some ways. It's really delicious. Right. It is. Yeah. And then, you know, years ago, people would have the fried bread here. Yes. Right. Well, that comes from the Indian community oh, really? as well. Yeah. I mean, so, some of it comes from the Portuguese community. Yeah, but the, the fry bread, and that's a, like not a, not a nice story with the Indians, the Native Americans. Well, there aren't a lot of nice stories. That's I another know. hashtag. Well, they, we, we yeah. took away all their food, and we basically left them with white flour and sugar and oil. Oh, take that. And, right? And all they could do was make a dough and fry it, and that's where that's we, they got a lot of diabetes. No kidding. Yeah. But it is still kind of considered a traditional food in those communities, but they're pulling it out because it has not a good history. Right. Well, they, it was served here in restaurants really? for breakfast. Yes. It was the fried bread. I mean, the fried dough. Yeah. And they put maple syrup and butter on top. It was served here in every single restaurant. Wow. Do yeah. you remember that, Corey? No. No. Yeah, I no. So I guess I'm just getting older and no, older. You're not, you're yeah, not, you're yeah but I'd say they did that, and it would be the smaller places that would yeah. do it, the small local places. And so there was always this discussion, did it come from the Portuguese community or did it come from the Indian community? So it was kind of a, yeah. a combination of that. Yeah. yeah, but if you were going to go out fishing or clamming or whatever, it really stuck to your ribs. Not like a Modiga steak. Though. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that, that was a different podcast. <laughs> been here for that one. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Melissa, right, for joining you. us. And uh, we'll see you next time on Short and Sweet. It was a great conversation. Thank All you. All right. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.